Good morning, good morning, Agape Chicago. Uh, what a joy it is to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're hopeful um, and grateful to have this opportunity, to have this virtual moment, and we're excited for the next hour to contemplate the humility and the exaltation of a particularly pivotal person in the history of humanity, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're praying that the Lord would just speak through his word this morning. In terms of announcements for Agape Communities, Blue Sky Cathedral, meeting 6.30 p.m. at the Johnsons, Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. Please email Steve Johnson at stevejohnson34 at hotmail.com. No return, 6.30 on Zoom, Wednesday, November, uh, December 4th, 27, 2020. Please email Laura Bruggers at lnbruggers at gmail.com. Tomorrow night, there's a women's prayer meeting, 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Please email Molly Hassett with any questions at hassettmb at gmail.com. We, um, our new app, as a church is powered by Subsplash. It's now available for download. You can go to the App Store for Apple products and Google Play for Android devices. You can delete the old app, Agape Chicago Church, and download the new one, Agape Chicago. Uh, you'll be able to give, catch up on previous online services, as well as have the church's calendar, among other things, all at your fingertips with the new streamlined app. We also have a story formed discipleship and evangelism curriculums that you can go through to help equip you to have evangelism and discipleship questions built on the life and stories of Jesus. If you want to uh, get a hold of those, either, either email Agape or Pastor Jeremiah. And we have a special event coming up this Friday due to COVID restrictions, Saturday, Saturday rather, I apologize, Saturday. Uh, we are going to um, direct our church to creative ways to see each other while still following uh, guide, guidance and guidelines. So this Saturday, November 28th at 10 a.m. at Indian Boundary Park, uh, 2500 West Lunt Ave, Drake Lupuago is going to offer a one-size-fits-all outdoor exercise class. Even Pastor Jeremiah is going to take part in the exercise and lead us in a spiritual exercise uh, with a brief reflection from scripture about God's purposes with our bodies. A moment you won't wanna miss out on, so please come and let us know um, if you're coming. Psalm 92, one and two says that it is good to give thanks to the Lord. It is good to sing to the Lord the most high, to declare his steadfast love in the morning and his faithfulness at night. So will you join us this morning as we believe that it is good to sing to the Lord. Good morning. We're two songs this morning. Um, Amen. And then Revelation song.
Would you join me this, this morning as we read our passage, Philippians 2, 1 through 11. When we're together, we usually stand. So we'd love to ask you to stand or just to posture your body or heart in such a way to receive God's word with reverence. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. Therefore, 
if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Man does not live by bread alone, but the man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Good morning, Agape. So this morning, we actually had the power go out a time or two over here at the office, which worried me a little bit about what we were going to do today. But far be it from me to be thankless on this, our Thanksgiving week. And uh, by the way, I am thankful today that I, in some sense, get an opportunity to uh, take a second go at some of what I talked about last week. Uh, you see, last week, I did what lots of leaders do in a particularly difficult time. I called for unity in the midst of hard times. Now, having just come off of an interesting political season, we know that leaders will often, after they have won, stress the importance of coming together as one after they have, in fact, won the race. And over time, that becomes quite difficult once they have asked for this kind of unity because sometimes almost half the people in their city, state, or even nation uh, were not supportive of their candidacy. Now, in the church, uh, unity becomes difficult because we are a part of this larger reality that we're, that's facing our nation, that we are quite divided, that we don't agree on many things. Of course, I've mentioned the election, but also our response to COVID-19, and even over the course of the year, the racial tensions and strifes that have come up over police brutality and the like have caused some of our divisions to uh, come to the top. And so this unity that I called for last week is indeed very important for our churches because we're caught up in all of this. We might, in fact, have difficulties with unity because even as churches, we have shared beliefs. We we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that God is one. We believe that God is three persons in one. In fact, in the Bible is God's word. And those are important truths to us. At the same time, we don't always share some other beliefs that given, given certain circumstances and between certain people, one might feel more important than the other. So unity is difficult and unity must come from a genuine place. It must come uh, from a heartfelt place. I, I don't actually want to call simply for unity for unity's sake, and I don't want to imagine that unity is easily won. In fact, it is very difficult. In fact, if it were easy, then my sermon today wouldn't be that necessary. But in fact, because unity in our hard times is so difficult, I'm thankful for the opportunity to give you something that I think is more important for the unity we seek. I want to call us today to see that there's something more important for the unity God calls for than even shared beliefs. There's something more essential in our lives that we want to experience the riches of friendship, the deep community, the oneness and fellowship that so many of us long for. There's an attribute that is key for us to invite Chicago together 
to feast on the love of Jesus. There is a secret ingredient, if you will, to knowing the love that God has eternally shared between Father, Son, and Spirit. And what is that secret ingredient today? Well, it's very simple. Uh, I want to suggest to you that the humble road to exaltation is our key to unity. The humble road to exaltation is our key to unity. And you, you see the connections between humility, exaltation, and unity. Uh, we believe as Christians one day God will say to those that have put their trust in Christ, well done, good and faithful servant. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to, as it were, make several links to some chains that are going to help to, to as if it were to a chain, to help us see the connections between our unity and the exaltation of us. So I want to help make sure that we understand those links today. And I want to make sure that you see them all. So these are the two links I'm going to make between our exaltation and our unity. The first one is humility enables exaltation. Humility enables, excuse me, humility enables unity. I wanted to make sure I made that clear. We've got someone vacuuming above us right now. Humility enables unity. And then exaltation enables humility. Humility enables unity. And then exaltation enables humility. So let's begin today first, that first link on a chain. Link number one, humility enables unity. Link number one, humility enables unity. Now, today is not the first time that the Apostle Paul is going to be connecting some important dots for us. Over the last few weeks, the Apostle Paul has connected some important truths for us. In fact, um, over the course of the last few weeks, we've been talking about the importance of joy, joy invincible. And the Apostle Paul in the first week talked about the fact that he had joy invincible, even in terrible times, even in the worst possible situations. And how did he have this unity? How did he have this joy? Excuse me. We well, had it because he recognized that Christ was Lord over his situations, as we talked about in week two. And then last week, we talked about the importance of unity for suffering. And today, the Apostle Paul continues in that same mindset, talking about unity, and he repeats some of the same ideas that he talked about last week. Now, if you will, turn with me to hear some of the same repetitions that we heard last week and then see how Paul advances his ideas on how unity is made possible. Read with me Philippians 2.1. It says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete. You see what Paul's doing here. Last week, he talked about the importance of living in a manner worthy of the gospel. He talked about the way that we're to live in a manner worthy of the gospel is to find unity in the same thing. And today, he talks about the shared experience of that beautiful gospel. He talks about the shared beauty of enjoying Christ Jesus and what he's done for us. You see, the Apostle Paul, he would have been in a situation where he remembered when Lydia and her household first believed that beautiful truth that Jesus loved them and gave himself for him. He would have been there when the jailer from Philippi turned to Christ in the midst of a miracle. He would have seen the joy of that early church, and he is reminding him, if you've had any of those things, then I want to call for a specific action. And what's that action again? Verse 2, it says this, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Again, that should sound familiar to you from last week. Paul is emphasizing this idea of unity, of oneness, of love, again, because it's very important to him. It's a big driving point for what he wants to see in this church. In fact, at the end of his letter, he is going to tell a few people to work through a difficult matter that they're going through. Paul really wants unity, but he doesn't simply want unity for unity's sake. You see, Paul isn't calling for some sort of nebulous unity. It's not some shallow call to oneness in the midst of deep hurts and pains. It's, it's a deeper call to unity than even that. It's more important than it's a it's a more important call to unity than just a unity behind shared beliefs. It's a call to unity behind what Christ has done for us and who we are now in the Holy Spirit. 
Paul is standing on the shoulders of Jesus, who in his last moments in life prayed for our unity. It's interesting when many of us consider Jesus' prayer in John 17 for our unity, that we might be one as he and the Father are one. That, in fact, he prays for that alongside of the strength he needs to endure crucifixion and the strength he wants for his disciples to endure the persecution they will face. What that tells me is that, of course, our unity is very important to Jesus, but it also tells me that it's very difficult. It's very hard. Jesus wouldn't have been praying for something like that alongside of strength in his crucifixion if it weren't, in fact, very difficult. And so we see that, in fact, Jesus and Paul experience a call and experience a shared desire for our unity. But do we have that same desire for unity? Do we, do we feel the need for oneness in Christ like this? And the answer, I think, isn't that complicated. The answer is sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Uh, we aren't that difficult. You see, we know in the abstract, that in theory, that unity is very good for us. We believe that when people are united, they accomplish more. We believe that when people are united, we receive mutual uplift. We are encouraging one another. We help one another in our needs, and we believe that in the abstract. And even when we're perhaps lonely, we wish that we had the kind of friendship that unity could provide. But then when we start striving for unity, we find out along the way why we were okay being alone in the first place. We find out that people cause us harm, that damage gets done when you're striving together for a common cause, that misunderstandings occur, that some people feel a certain way about how you handle a matter and others feel very strongly in the opposite direction. And you have to find a healthy way to work that out. And that is not, in fact, easy. So this unity... It's difficult, and it's something that is a priority to Christ and the New Testament writers. So I want to ask the question, then, if this is so important, and I, I think it's important to most of us when we're at our best, how do we actually get there? Uh, what's the secret sauce? And I've already started by helping you see that humility is going to be my answer, but let me dive into what that means a little bit. What is the secret to unity that Paul wants to deliver to us? We begin in verses three and four to answer that question. It says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. Now, this is a very interesting idea. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I, I, I wanted to tell an old joke, and this is a pretty standard stuff for preachers. I looked up the word nothing, and it means nothing. That means that you're to do nothing in life that is feeding your selfish ambition and your vain conceit. And this is incredibly difficult for us because we actually value ambition. Uh, you don't hear motivational speakers going around on their circuits telling people to aim low and to have low expectations for themselves, to settle for mediocrity. If a preacher got up and said, you're really not going to amount to much, so just have modest expectations for your life, uh, people would quickly tune us out. We celebrate ambition because we recognize it's good in our lives. We love being around ambitious people because they inspire us, they drive us forward, they carry their own weight, they make the world a better place. Ambition, from a biblical standpoint, is a good thing. The problem comes when you add the adjective selfish to that noun, ambition, and they become a concoction of evil. In fact, when we see selfish added to ambition, we take God's given gifts to us, and we make them something that we use for our own purposes, without regard for the rest of the world and how we can benefit our neighbor. Add to that this other ingredient, vain conceit, the idea that perhaps people don't appreciate us like they ought to, our skills, our wit, our intellect, our abilities, our love, and our service, our value to the kingdom of God. And we're called to never, ever do either of those things. Never means never. It means, let me make this clear, that if you, are ha if you have ambitions and they are for your own good, without regard for others, then you're never to do that thing as a Christian. Ever, ever, ever. That sounds quite strong. How do we do that? 
To make sense of that, we must see the positive side of this command, which is found in verse 4, which tells us to value others above ourselves. And that's the most important part of this whole thing, that we actually somehow value other people above ourselves. And what does that mean exactly? Uh, does that mean that somehow I think that I'm worth $400 and Ralph on the other end of this camera is worth $500? Well, kind of, but not exactly. It's a, it's a way of talking about esteeming someone as higher than ourselves. It's about focusing on the good of another, the beauty and the wonder of being in a world full of God's image bearers. When someone goes and stares at a sunset, they don't actually have a calculating mind that the sun is more valuable than themselves. They're just so focused on that beautiful star that they have lost sight of their own value in view of the value of that moment. And it's the same way when we interact with those that have been created in God's image, even if, in fact, we are now twisted in some ways, that we are amazed that we get to be in a world full of God's image bearers and work alongside of one another, that we esteem, that we value other people above ourselves. And out of that, we begin to seek their interests above our own. And that order is absolutely important. Because if you don't actually value someone else above yourselves, the act of service can become a very corrupt thing. In fact, sometimes it's very possible for our service to be about our interest, about getting the pat on the back, feeling celebrated, feeling appreciated, and the like. And this is the sort of thing that leads to all the sorts of problems that people highlight from Christian practice sometimes. Savior complexes, um, uh, codependence, uh, the, the, need, the burnout that comes from over-service without the right heart. What Paul is trying to drive at here is not that somehow we go about the process of serving other people without first thinking of themselves, thinking of others more highly than we think of ourselves. Now, that's the means I want to suggest of getting to this unity, that somehow we elevate other people above ourselves. That How do we get motivation to do that? I mean, that, that's, I mean that's honestly a complete hardwiring change. I mean, it's a, it's a complete rewiring of our mindset. Um, in science fiction, it is common for humans to create some sort of creature, a robot, a Frankenstein, uh, artificial intelligence, and to find that that creation has some sort of fundamental flaw, that there's something deeply wrong with it. And so the rest of those stories are about how do I end up wiping out this creature or rewiring it, reprogramming it to make something better. And Christianity teaches that God, in creating us, chose the rewiring route. He chose the hardwiring change in us. He wants to make us different than we are now somehow. That somehow, yes, we can hold on to ambition. Yes, we can have appropriate self-esteem. But we also learn to esteem others above ourselves. And I want to help you see the motivation in that from Philippians 2, 5 through 8. It says this, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, verse 5 isn't actually using motivation language. It's a command. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And that's really the same thing as saying values others above yourself. So again, he's repeating the means that the way that we get to unity, the way that we get to these deep relationships. And he does so by showing that both the means and the motivation is found in the same place in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, some will talk about Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and suggest that Paul is borrowing an early Christian hymn, a Christian hymn that preceded even himself in his own writings. Others will say that Paul, in a, in a flurry of excitement, wrote some poetry in the midst of a letter. I'm not here to navigate those difficulties because there are many complications in deciding which it was. What I am here to do is to make it clear to you that Paul sees as absolutely essential 
and our understanding of how we're to live the nature and identity of Jesus Christ. Um, what we call the incarnation, the idea that as this passage says that Jesus was God but did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage, tells us that Jesus was God. But it tells us also that being found in appearance as a man, which means that he was, a, he came not merely to, as a man, but as God who was also a man, we believe that Christ was 100% God and 100% man. And that's the stuff some of you think of abstract theology, the difficult things that Christians say and repeat, but we never explain and we never connect. We never actually help people navigate along the way. What does this mean for our lives? Oh, that's the complicated stuff. Let's let theologians talk about that. And we'll focus on the practical matters of life. But what's sad in our current Christian milieu, what's sad in our, Christ, our current Christian uh, culture is that churches all around the world treat doctrines like this, which early Christians saw as the foundation and the fountain for the Christian life, as if they didn't really have anything to do with us. You see, without understanding the incarnation, we rob ourselves of something essential for driving us forward for the humble life that makes unity possible. The incarnation, the, the fact that Christ became man, is the driving point for the humility that I'm talking about. I don't think anything else in the world has the staying power to make the unity that we need possible. It, nothing else has the power to make us humble like this except seeing that god humbled himself in such a way and i hasten to add that uh, over the years i've met with a ton of people at starbucks and local coffee shop for meals um, to talk about the deep questions that they have about god and every single time i talk to someone inevitably the questions uh, start coming about two interrelated topics the incarnation the fact that jesus is man and god and therefore related the fact that God is three persons in one, Father, Son, and Spirit. For if Jesus is full of God, then he must be part of this triune being. And when I start talking about that, they realize that this is important, but they can't wrap their minds around it. And what I want to suggest to us as Christians is that a big part of what we are to be doing in the world for our neighbor is not simply to being a, not simply telling people these truths, but helping them speak see how they connect to their life and what better place to start than Philippians 2 with someone than with a neighbor if your neighbor comes to you and says well I think that we should uh, treat our neighbors like we would want to be treated ourselves you could say to them well isn't that amazing that I serve a God who did not decide to stay away from us but came to serve us as again slaves remember that word servant can be translated as slave and that's what Christ did for us. Again, if your neighbor uh, considers it important that God understands our suffering, what better message do we have than that God entered our suffering and experienced it with us? You see, if we have a God that did not become man, dear folks, uh, then he's simply a rule giver. He's somewhere distant. But he has no care for our current predicament. He doesn't care about those people that are thrown into freezers and body bags right now all around the world while he's just like us cold and indifferent to the suffering of humanity. But if we have a God that became human, that humbled himself even to the point of death, then we have a God that knows the deepest and most painful aspects of human suffering, just like we do, and knew its purpose, knew what he was doing in the midst of it. We cannot offer hope to the world and even ourselves apart from understanding these deep truths of Christianity. And it's our job to creatively and with all of our energy and efforts, think about ways to understand these truths and to make them plain to our neighbors, especially as it relates to their lives. What I want us to see, dear friends, is that when we look at Jesus, who became human like us, took on the form of a slave and, and died a criminal's death on the cross, Jesus is the one that we know is truly empathetic is truly compassionate towards every aspect of our human suffering, even the worst amongst us. He died outside the city gates, naked, rejected, abused, mistreated, so that he could show that all of those that have ever faced such poverty, such difficulty in this life, that Christ knows our pain and wants to serve us all. You see, Christ looked out for our interest. Jesus didn't merely serve as an example to us. 
His example actually did something for us and to us. It saved us. By looking out, not for his own interest, that is the interest of his physical satisfaction while on earth, he was certainly looking out for his glory and the Father's glory. But out of that, he made sure that we get to appreciate and enjoy that beauty, that glory with him. And so with that, we already see the connection between humility and unity. You wonder perhaps why I haven't defined humility yet in my sermon, because I wanted to let Christ humility make that definition. Because you see, many of us think that humility is about thinking lowly of ourselves, but that can't be what humility is. For Christ knew that he was God, but yet still humbled himself to die on the cross. Humility isn't thinking less about yourself, as many pastors say, but it's thinking about yourself less. It's being focused more on God and others. Humility, as the definition that I'm going to bring up says, is humility is simply seeing ourselves as God sees us for God's service. And that's what Christ did. Christ saw himself as belonging to God, obeying God for the good of us. And now following Christ, we do the same. So make sure you're connecting the dots here. Unity is something that is necessary to our growth, is necessary to God's purposes on earth. It's a good thing, but it becomes a very hard thing when we suffer at the hands of uh, people that do us wrong, we disagree, and the like. But humility that values other people above ourselves, like Christ did for us, is the means that we have for overcoming our disunity, our heart, our hurts, our pains. And we need that at times like these when so many people are prone to division. Jesus gives us the ground and foundation for a deeper and better unity. We don't need unity behind bad ideas or lies. We need unity behind the truth. And Christ is truth. Now, you might say, well, wait a second. Uh, I still need a little bit more motivation towards this humility. Uh, towards this unity. And what I want to do is suggest that, yes, I've already started by showing you some motivation, but there's more. Yes, Jesus died for us, but there's more to the poem. And I want to make sure that we have our second link today. Link number two, exaltation enables humility. Link number two, exaltation enables humility. And this one's much easier to show. It's found in the back three verses of our passage. Verse 9 says this, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. What does that therefore relate back to? Why did God do this? Well, because Jesus served him perfectly as a servant, as a human being that did everything that the Father desired and pleased. And so therefore God lifted Jesus up and placed his name above all other names. Well, what does that exactly mean? It's just a fancy way of saying that Jesus now has a name that is far more famous and his name will be far more famous forever than anyone else's. Uh, we, we can say that Abraham Lincoln has a great name, but Jesus' name is far greater. Abraham Lincoln was a great president who served for a time. Jesus is the king who reigned forever. The name Albert Einstein connects in our minds with one of the most brilliant people humanity has ever seen and the greatest physicist we've ever known the uh, articulator of the theory of relativity. Well, Jesus is actually not only now the creator of all the laws that govern our universe, but now he is the one who has defeated the laws of the universe, the, the physical laws, by rising from the dead never to die again. And so now we recognize that he is above every single great name in human history and above all the names of those that have opposed him and his people throughout time and space your Nero, your Diocletian, those Roman emperors that were evil and great persecutors of the Christian martyrs, but also even more recent people like your Napoleon and your Stalin, people that look forward to a day where Christ would be forgotten. His name is above theirs and so many other names that will so easily be discarded in human history because Christ has a name that's above every name. And now we look forward to the day where this is going to happen, verses 10 through 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That's the people that are already dead, folks. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That means right now that we are looking forward to a day when the whole 
the whole history of humanity will be gathered and will recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. There are some people that now use the name of Jesus as a curse word, but now in the future, we look towards Jesus as the one that every time will bless and say, we have seen the glory of God. And we are looking forward to a day when we recognize that Jesus will be lifted high. Right now, we date our years according to that name. And one day, every name and every person will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is worth all of our admiration and appreciation. Jesus is exalted now, and it's only a dim reflection of what we do, right? of what the exaltation that he will see one day. We praise him now as churches all around the world when we can gather but when all people are gathered before him, it will be a beaut- uh, sight to behold. And so what I want to tell you, dear friends, is that this is the future of humanity. But what has that exaltation to do with us? The answer to that question comes in understanding what Jesus said in one of his parables at the end, where he said, all who humble themselves will be exalted. Or as Paul says in another one of his letters, all those that die with Christ will rise with Christ. That we are the follow-up fruits to the first fruits of Jesus Christ, and we will receive some of the glory that is due Jesus. We will bask in his beauty and his glory, and we will receive a similar exaltation. That is the truth. And here's, here's the thing, folks. Here's the thing, and this is so important. You see, what's really going to enable your humility is exaltation. Now, this is, in fact, I think the most important part of my message, and here's why. Because you hear this stuff, and you say, this is standard Christian theology. You know, I've heard this before. But think about how contrary this is to how we think about things. Nobody really thinks that the way you become humble is through exaltation. Consider, Michael Jordan and Tom Brady are the greatest athletes in my time, in my generation. No one thinks that by them winning all those championships that they somehow become more humble on the way. Perhaps they became more hungry, you'd have to ask them. No one sees a person after they win a political victory really become more humble. They become more braggadocious. They become more proud. When a nation defeats a foreign nation, they tell the story of how the good guys defeat the bad guys and how those other people are those other people face a, a much greater enemy. We don't understand a world where the winners somehow become humble. That does not make sense to us. In our modern conversation, so many people think that the only way that you can humble someone is to humiliate them. And so many of us are clamoring and hoping perhaps for one day, some of those that are exalted in our sight right now to be humiliated somehow especially by us in this current day and age. Perhaps the 1%, the bourgeois, the haves, will somehow be humiliated. And this is no way for a Christian to think. The Christian understands that the only path to true humility, deep humility, isn't by being humiliated. You can have a terrible life and still not be humble. You can experience deep pain and suffering and still think very highly of yourself. It's very possible to be so self-absorbed, in fact, that when life treats you bad is proof to you that you deserve better. Humility does not actually come to humiliation. It comes to recognizing that we with Christ will be exalted and that we did not deserve such an exaltation. We didn't do anything to do it. No astronaut believes that they will go to the moon somehow on their own strength of power. They recognize that they need a spaceship. So a Christian recognizes that the exaltation that is ours requires a great salvation, a salvation that we can never accomplish on our own. And that exaltation enables humility. It enables the type of humility that says, you know what? I cannot believe I get something like this, and I want to pass that along. It's really that simple. It really is the way forward. And so you've seen my connection all the way to exaltation, back to humility, back to unity. You see the fact that we are all, as a people, church, those that will join in Christ's exaltation, how can we do anything else but strive for and fight for unity in the midst of our our pains, our struggles, our slights, our being overlooked, the hardships of working through pandemics, How can we do anything less? It's it's what Christ did for us. 
we must recognize that humility properly understood recognizes that we are going heading towards an exaltation and that drives us forward. That's what's going to make us one people. G.K. Chesterton said it well, and he helped us understand the connection between this true humility and moving forward. He says this, humility has new, moved from the center of our ambitions. Humility has settled upon the source of conviction where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. Nowadays, the part of a man that a man does assert is exactly the part he ought not to assert himself. The part he doubts is exactly the part he ought not to doubt, the divine reason. The old humility was a spur that prevented a man from stopping, not a nail in his boot that prevented him from going on. For the old humility made a man doubtful about his efforts, which might make him work harder. But the new humility makes a man doubtful about his aims which will make him stop working altogether. What Chesterton understood in the early 1900s is what I've been talking about over the last year plus about the, the, the age of the radical self, where we assert our selfhood at the expense of what God is doing in the world, even in the church. And that paralyzes us. It keeps us from doing the very things God commands. Well, on the flip side, if we recognize who we are in light of Christ, it drives us forward. It helps us strive. And it helps us consider other people even better than ourselves, which is the very thing that helps us seek other people's interest. You see, I can give you creative ideas for how we can serve one another at a distance this Thanksgiving and Christmas season. I can suggest to you things like I said last week, like random words of kindness or random acts of kindness, like dropping off a pound of coffee or some flowers or going and, and, and saying hi to someone who, will, who doesn't feel comfortable going outside. But the truth is, if we get the kind of humility that comes from knowing the exaltation that is ours, and therefore lift other people's interest above our own because we value them above ourselves, I don't have to give you these ideas. You're going to be so creative and so thoughtful and so reflective that there are just going to be so many wonderful things that we do for each other we wouldn't be able to actually name and consider them all this season, my friends. So what I want to do is I want to end with the hope that this season we consider one another above ourselves because nobody wants to be in the situation we're in. How much more then should we be looking for opportunities to serve in such a hard time? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to preach here. You know, it's uh Again, this is the week of celebrating Christ and being thankful. And I want to be thankful. Yes, God, we, we can't go to the 400. And yes, someone decided to vacuum right in the middle of our service. And that's, that's funny um, because you cannot be defeated, Christ, um, because you cannot lose the day. We are servants of you that are on, en route to an exaltation that we share with the risen Lord Christ. And so with that, uh, the, the temporary and momentary struggles that we face, we, we place at your feet, Jesus, and we say, help us to esteem others better than ourselves, that we might experience the unity you have for us. Father, I want to thank you for our church. I want to thank you for those that are not with us today, which is most of us. And I want to thank you for those that serve us. Uh, and I want to thank you for Craig. And I want to thank you for Ralph. And I want to thank you for Amy. I want to I bless their names, and I want, I want to ask that you would bless them as well, Father, in your own way, in your own timing. God, we as your church need unity in this difficult time, and I know that in myself, I, I, I need a conviction of your radical love for me, and I pray that you would do that for all of our hearts. Father, we can't be motivated, even in reading the word, apart from your spirit, so spirit Help us behold these truths that our ears hear, but perhaps don't feel deeply. Help our hearts to be warmed by your love, Christ, that we might love others in the same fashion. We pray this in the name of Christ the King. Amen. Amen, amen. Wanted to give an offering update uh, for the year. As of today, we've received a total of uh, 94000 Four hundred and ninety dollars and fifty-five cents for our offering, which which puts us behind by 
$28,394.12. And just want to continue to encourage you to give, knowing that this season has been difficult for many. And as I reflect on, on giving, there's just thoughts of like, man, my life is not my own. My money and finances are not my own, but, but gifts from the Lord, I get to give back to him. So maybe I want to continue to encourage you in that posture and, and thought. Tomorrow, there's a women's prayer meeting uh, with Molly Hassett, um, 6.30 p.m. Email her at hassettmd at gmail.com with any questions. And remember, again, with the COVID restrictions, we're still trying to see each other. And so next Saturday, uh, November 28th at 10 a.m. At, at Indian Boundary Park, which is located address uh, 2500 West Lunt Ave. Uh, Drake Luguago is going to offer the one size fits all outdoor exercise. Following that, Pastor Jeremiah, I will end just with a brief reflection from scripture about God's purposes with our bodies. So please do let us know if you're coming. I will hope to see you. Um, and brothers and sisters, may the spirit of Christ empower you to do nothing out of selfish ambition, nothing out of vain conceit. May you value others above yourself. May you not look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. May we this week look to the God who took on flesh and blood in Christ and see humility perfectly embodied. The most humble one to ever walk this earth is likewise the exalted one uh, by God was exalted to the highest place, given a name above every other name. And, and I would encourage and exhort you this week that may your knee bow to this Jesus. And may your tongue confess once again that Jesus Christ is Lord. It may all be to the glory of God our Father. You belong to this God. So may the joy and the unity and the exaltation of Jesus Christ be with you this week. Uh, go in peace.